How's the Trump campaign doing in the final stretch, everybody? We got Erin Perini with us now. She's director of press communications for the Trump campaign. So let's talk about the way the campaign feels, how the president feels about that uh, town hall last night. I've shared my thoughts already with this audience, but uh, what did y'all think? Well, you know, it wasn't surprising to see that uh, it ended up turning into a debate, even if the debate commission had canceled the debate. You know, the president had to end up debating uh, Savannah Guthrie instead of Joe Biden. Uh, But he did an exceptional job. She was clearly out there with a motivation and an agenda um, to continue to try and spread lies and disinformation about President Trump. Um, But after her 20 minute, you know, uh, pushing on the president, she finally let the people in the audience ask questions and Uh, The president did a great job speaking directly to the people of Florida about their concerns, about their questions. And, you know, he did it. He did an absolutely fantastic job yesterday, as opposed to Joe Biden, who, you know, got to go on these long uh, answers, uh, was not pushed by George Stephanopoulos whatsoever, and actually had a former Obama Biden speechwriter in the audience asking questions. So tell me this. Why did the Commission on Presidential Debates, which is a thing that I think shouldn't exist, but anyway, why did that body decide that there couldn't be a debate this week exactly in person? I know they wanted a virtual debate, but what was the problem with the personal debate? Yeah, uh, you know, we're not really sure. They said that they didn't want to do it. Uh, They didn't consult us with it. Uh, But, you know, there was no medical reason whatsoever, no scientifically based reason that we could not have an in-person debate debate. you know, yesterday, uh, but they declined to do that. It's clear that they are extremely biased, extremely partisan, uh, and working to try and help Joe Biden. I mean, th- those are just the facts of what have been happening time and again during this debate calendar. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the debate next week happens. And we have even put forth the idea of adding an additional debate on the 29th to make sure that we do the full three in-person debates that we agreed to uh, when we agreed to the initial calendar. Has the campaign, has the Trump campaign uh, uh, agreed to any specific changes in, in format or anything like that after that first Chris Wallace debate? There was a lot of talk of it. And then obviously the president came down as uh, COVID positive. He's since beaten that. Thank God. But is there any change to what we saw from what we saw then? Because I know the campaigns are supposed to at least agree upon these rules in advance. Uh, Nothing that's been finalized or announced at this point. Obviously, the negotiations are ongoing for this third and final debate. Uh, And as things get kind of solidified and set to go, we'll be able to share that. But, you know, whatever they do, it's clear that the the commission is going to try and help Joe Biden uh, and prop him up for really not doing a good job in these debates. And so, you know, we want to make sure that ultimately this is a fair debate process. We want to make sure that we uh, that President Trump gets to speak and answer the questions and that he gets to push back on the lies that we know Joe Biden tells during these debates. So that's ultimately the goal here. Speaking to Aaron Perini, uh, she is the director of press communications for the Trump campaign, telling us what's going on with the campaign. To that end, uh, the president is going to be speaking what tonight, just in a little bit here in Georgia. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, tonight the president's going to be in Macon, Georgia, for another Make America Great Again event uh, at the airport there at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we know, uh, you know, how important it is for the president to get out there. A, he loves being able to talk directly to the American people without the media bias or filter over top. Uh, It's always a great way for us to get more data into the campaign to see where voters are, what their propensity is, because we generally see, you know, we've had a few rallies recently uh, in states like Pennsylvania and and in uh, other states where we've seen that, you know, between a quarter and a third of the registrants for these rallies, the voters we can identify based off our data are not Republicans. And so that means we're continuing to expand the base. So you'll see him in Georgia. He's going to be in Wisconsin the day after. He's crisscrossing the country, making sure he can get the message directly to the American people in this final stretch ahead of Election Day. Aaron, you mentioned the data. A lot of questions coming into my my show this week about the polls. Uh, People are saying that they're worried because there's a lot of, you know, you go in the real clear politics, average of polls, looking battleground states. And it's showing a lot of of Biden plus some number. Some of the numbers are pretty big. What's the campaign's feeling? I know you have your internals, which you can't necessarily just share with us here on the show. But what's the campaign's feeling about these polls that folks are seeing? Because some are asking me, is this meant to uh, dishearten and even suppress the Trump vote? 
Well, I mean, it certainly looks that way, right? Because we're looking at time and again where the data is is wrong and is and is off that you're seeing in these polls. Listen, this is an incredibly close race, and you're not seeing that reflected in in the national polls right now. Because you see, even if you look at the real clear politics average on uh, uh, October 10th, 2016, in Pennsylvania, for example, you saw Clinton up 8.6%. October 10th, 2020, you saw Joe, you see Joe Biden up 7.1%. President Trump won by 0.7 there. And in our recent rally there, we identified 14,000 voters. Of that, 26.8% of them were not Republicans. And another 19.9% of them were Democrats. So if we look at the numbers that come in from our data based on our incredible data game, our voter scores and what we know about voters, we see that not only is the enthusiasm high for President Trump, but it's bringing in outside votes. And that's just Pennsylvania. We see it in states like Wisconsin as well, where they're, where you, the national numbers you are seeing are off, and it is used as a suppression tool for people who support President Trump. What can you tell us about the ground game for the Trump campaign, given this just crazy and very difficult year of, of COVID-19 and all the social distancing stuff and crowds and all this. So h- how effective, I mean, how have they adapted and what are they doing to give people a little bit of a encouragement, especially in those battleground states, that the ground game is strong? Absolutely. The ground game we have is strong and it's the strongest that's ever happened in political history. You know, back in the 26 or in the 2012 cycle, uh, the Obama people used to say they had the biggest grassroots army. They had the best, uh, you know, uh, ground game out there with 2.2 million volunteers. We have 2.5 million volunteers who have made over 100 million voter contacts across the country. And just in North Carolina alone, we have made 9.4 million voter contacts. And that continues to rise. And now that we're in the final days, we have the army built out to be able to continue to knock doors and make phone calls. We were down on doors for a little bit. And, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, we brought that back online in June. And we are nonstop because we know the data is clear. You knock on a door, you're 17 percent more likely to show up. All of this is data driven. And it's an incredible data grassroots army married together to get the message directly to voters. Because right now we're just making sure we're getting out of the vote. That's what we're doing. If that's your absentee ballot and that's early in person or if that's on Election Day, we're going to make sure we know where our voters are and we're going to flush them out right now to make sure we win in November. We're speaking to Aaron Perini. She is the uh, press uh, director of press communications for the Trump campaign. Aaron, uh, before we let you get back to the campaign, there's supposed to be a debate next week. What do we know about it? What's been agreed to? And uh, wh- how should everybody be getting ready for it? Absolutely. So we uh, certainly want to see a debate happen next week. President Trump's been clear about that. Uh, as of this point, the debate commission has not announced any changes in format or any changes to that happening in person. I know that's really important to the president that we make sure we're out there talking directly to the American people and that he's really in the same room as Joe Biden when we do it. So you will see, uh, you know, we're going to be there. It's going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. It's going to be foreign policy focused. And you're going to see, you know, the president be able to stand up and hold Joe Biden to account for his failures because even Rob, uh, you know, Robert Gates said that Joe Biden was on the wrong side of history on every major foreign policy issue. That's going to be the highlight next week. We want to make sure the American people get to see what a true commander in chief looks like. Aaron Perini, thanks so much for joining us from the Trump campaign. Good luck. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. The good news for all of us is that we're going to get through this election pretty soon here, and then we will have a series of holidays, and the holidays will make things a little bit better for us. But if you want to listen to the Fouch, sorry, the holiday this year, you're going to have to eat a turkey alone. Don't eat too much. It'll cause the formation of adipose tissue. Adipose tissue can create inflammation in the cells. Inflammation in the cells lowers immunity. You basically eat too much turkey, you die of COVID. I'm just here to explain the science so you all know. That's why I'm here. The vouch wants you to say, look, I mean, you want to be thankful for something? Be thankful for the fact that I'm not making you wear a mask when you go to sleep at night or when you take a shower, because I might have to. I might have to pull you all together and tell you that. Here he is saying, um, your Thanksgiving is going to stink this year. Play 21. 
I think given the uh, fluid and dynamic nature of what's going on right now in the spread and the uptick of infections, I think people should be very careful and prudent about social gatherings, particularly when members of the family might be at a risk because of their age or their underlying condition. Namely, you may have to bite the bullet and sacrifice that social gathering unless you're pretty certain that the people that you're dealing with are not infected. Either they've been very recently tested or they're living a lifestyle in which they don't have any interaction with anybody except you and your family, then it's okay. I mean, this is what this uh, so-called public health official uh, expert tells people now. Live life like a hermit and there can be no joy until he says so. Until the Fouch says you're allowed to have holidays, you can't really have a holiday. Not allowed. You know, you can have a, a gathering of one, you know, and you have, you know, for example, okay, Halloween, what do you do? Can you send the kids out to trick or treat? No, you can't. So what you do instead is you have your kid wear a little costume and let him walk in the kitchen and put a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of maybe uh, Reese's Pieces or some other such sugary treat in the bowl. And that's it. Not as fun as seeing the friends, not as fun as being out in the neighborhood, but that's what you got to do. What about Thanksgiving? Oh, you know, Thanksgiving, who needs a big turkey and all this? Your climate change footprint's going to be very big with that turkey. So why not just, you know, go some steamed vegetables, very healthy, stay alone indoors. One day, I'll tell you you're allowed to have your life back, but probably not for another year or two. So this is the world we're living in now, folks. The world we're living in now because we've uh, given up so much of our autonomy and so much of the authority. Notice, you know, they'll tell you, so much about how we should have choices about people's bodies when it comes to one thing. But when it comes to like stifling, when, when we really know it's actually about protecting a life. But anyway, and we got a whole other thing here about, you know, you can't have any breathing of fresh air and just like living like a normal person. Not allowed. Not allowed. You know, if you get tested. You're not going to get the results back particularly quickly. And so if you're tested and you're going to see your Aunt Ethel five days later, doesn't really mean anything. Because you would have had five days where you th technically could have gotten infected. But, you know, the other side of this, too, is that the treatment of this has gotten better. They know more about it. They have some therapeutics to actually use for people. They keep talking about cases all the time. The, the death rate remains much lower than it was during, during previous spikes. And uh, we, at some point, are just going to realize that the people that have been telling you all along, stay home, stay home, stay away from people, stay away from everybody, uh, they have nothing better to say, and they're committed to this idea. They're committed to being right and to having control over you. They're not committed to what's best for you. And perhaps there's no better example of that mentality than Governor Cuomo, the Italy virus, the France, the Spain virus. What do I mean by a Spain virus? The Spain virus is a very, very tiny thing. Viral, viral particles is very small. You can't, even, you can't even, like, you think small, like, oh, what about the speck that's in my marinara sauce? No, smaller than that. Very tiny. But Governor Cuomo has written a book on being serious, and in his book, he talks about the things that he did to save everybody. But what about all the people you say he didn't save because he's the worst at this ever? No, 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 no. We're rewriting history with the book. That's the point. Here's Cuomo himself speaking, if you can tell the difference. Play 16. You know, in the very beginning, the federal government said that they were in charge of testing and they were doing the testing and it was taking a long time. I should have said, forget it. Uh, I don't care what you say. The state should have started the testing earlier. Uh, we got ambushed by the virus. We had no idea that it was coming from Europe. It had been coming from Europe for three months, uh, and uh, everybody missed it. But that, that put New York in the hole. They kept calling it the China virus. It wasn't the China virus. It was the Italy virus and the France virus and the Spain virus who came here from Europe. Uh, they said there was no such thing as asymptomatic uh, spread. They right. said that you only spread it when you had symptoms. You had a cough, you had a sneeze, etc. That was all right. wrong. 
uh, it turned out that you could spread it even without symptoms. And that's how it got into nursing homes. So there's some things that we should all get clear on here because you're going to hear a ton of rewriting history and hat tip to my old uh, colleague, uh, Stu Bergeer, great dude. Uh, You know him from Glenn Beck's radio show. He put out a thread today about Cuomo's rewriting of, of COVID history. He writes, Andrew Cuomo's new book is out, a fictional tale in which he proclaims himself master of coronavirus and viral savior of New York. But that's not even close to true. Let's go through Cuomo's actions in the most important month, March. March 1st, New York Governor Cuomo announces New York City's first confirmed case of COVID. March 2nd, Cuomo spends this period arguing New Yorkers were worrying too much. Quote, in this situation, the facts defeat fear because the reality is reassuring. It is deep breath time. That's what Cuomo was saying in March, folks. March 3rd, Cuomo finally takes immediate action on the crisis. The vaping crisis holds a rally at Capitol, uh, at the New York Capitol. No vape New York trends on Twitter. That's right. Vaping was the big problem. March 1st, Cuomo, we have an epidemic caused by coronavirus, but we we have an epidemic, uh, have a bigger epidemic that is caused by fear. March 5th, think of criticism lobbed at the Trump administration about downplaying the virus. Cuomo does this over and over. He keeps going on. March 7th, after weeks of telling people not to worry so much and comparing COVID to the flu, Cuomo signs executive order declaring virus a disaster emergency in New York. March 8th, coronavirus cases hit triple digits. Cuomo tries to convince New Yorkers not to worry. This is not the Ebola virus. This is not SARS. This is a virus we have a lot of information on. It just just keeps going on. And March 9th, Cuomo downplays the effect of the virus. This is not Ebola. That's hysteria you see. That's fear you see. That's panic. That's unwarranted. The worst response by the numbers in the country, Democrat Cuomo writing a book about how good he was on COVID. This is sociopathic. It's time for Roll Call. Facebook.com slash Buck Sexton. If you want to send us messages, if you want to email us, team Buck at iHeartMedia.com or send us a direct message on Instagram. Just please, no profanity in the subject line because then I'll know that you're a lib and we won't we won't read the rest of it. Uh, let's get to it. Or if you, And if you really want to be smart, you should say, In the subject line, producer Mark is a handsome genius uh, who helps Buck keep us safe and warm at night. And then all of a sudden you will magically be a part of Roll Call. Um, Speaking of our of our wonderful genius producer, Mark, how's your weekend looking, buddy? It's terrible weather here in New York. So are you just going to hunker down, Netflix it up? Are you a Netflix or a Hulu guy mostly? I have both or whatever I feel like watching. If you could. all okay, between Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix for those digital video platforms, you could only have one. Based on, you know, what they've done so far, which one would it be? That's a tough choice. It's got to be either Netflix or I'm going to throw HBO Max into the uh, equation there. They've got a lot of good stuff on there. I haven't seen that one, so maybe I have to check that one out. I love Amazon Prime because I feel like it's idiot proof. If you're willing to just throw money away on renting old movies that you shouldn't have to pay for, but they'll charge you three dollars, you can pretty much see anything. And they have some great original stuff on Amazon Prime, too. The Boys. um, Bosch. There have been some very, very good Amazon Prime shows that I've. I've uh, we we watched one show called Upload, where it's like this universe where you get to if you die you get to become a digital person, like an avatar of yourself or something. Kind of like that, yeah. It was actually really awesome. I wasn't expecting much. It was only ten episodes. It was like a sitcom, like thirty minutes. It was really, really good and interesting. And uh, have you ever done what's the What's that multiplayer game that everybody was obsessed with for a while that everybody like a year or two ago was the rage and, every, you know, people were Fortnite. Have you ever done this thing? No, I have not. Because it's going to be a rainy, crappy weekend. So I'm looking for ways to you know expand my time wasting abilities. So I feel like Fortnite would probably be a good way to check it out. I thought you were a Call of Duty guy. I mean, I'm getting I'm actually getting to the point now in Call of Duty where I'm getting a, a little too good. I have to start using a sidearm only because I want it to be fair for people. So I'm just saying probably also should be time that I spend uh, researching and uh, going to the gym instead. But I'm working on it. I'm going to yeah, maybe this. make some of those podcasts you keep promising. Well, we do have one in the books, as you know. And when are we planning to release? So when are we releasing Malta, producer Mark? Do we know yet? Uh, I'm good? not sure. We discussed this off the air like we should be having this conversation, Fine. but you said we would have a couple of them ready before yes. we released yes, them, so yes, we don't... Fair, you know, fair. Yeah. Okay. 
But I'm th- I'm thinking we'll try. I'm going to try to do Dracula in advance of Halloween, and then do uh, part two of Malta, and we'll start doing those probably after the election. <laughs> Especially if Trump loses the election, I want people to have things that aren't political that they can listen to and be like, ah, oh, they can relax. So, I mean, I'd say win or lose. Uh, the election's a busy time. We're kind of hyper focused right now. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair too. I don't want this to get lost in the in the uh, the madness. All right. Now it's, um, oh, is Mrs. Mark around this weekend or are you solo? She, she's around. Okay, nice. So at least I won't be that bored. My parents took the dog back today because she needed to have a, just a routine vet appointment. And I'm like, but I want the dog. And then I have to remind myself it's technically their dog. But she's so much fun to have around the house that when she's not here now, and I don't want to get like a gerbil or something, you know, if I'm going to get a pet, it's got to be a dog, so... I feel like one day you're just going to go to their apartment and take the dog and see if they notice. Dog napping? Yeah, they, they would notice. <laughs> I could tell you they would notice. Uh, my dad, my dad would, be, uh, would be out there leading a, uh, a search party. All right, let's get to uh, the thoughts from the roll call, folks. Brandy. Buck, nobody's asking Joe Biden what role, if any, Hunter Biden might play in a potential Biden administration. Americans deserve to know. Well... He could definitely be, you know, I don't know. He'd probably want to be head of the Food and Drug Administration, but not thinking that we mean pharmaceuticals. Uh, I don't think Biden's son is going to be a part of it, e- even if Biden wins, which could happen, but I don't think it will. I don't think it will. Uh, Hunter Biden's not going to be a part of any of this. I really strongly doubt that, honestly. So um, that would be a little bit too much. Although I'm just going to say this, folks, Republicans, we have completely signed on for the precedent of family members get in a presidential administration, very important government roles, government paychecks, real government powers. And people have been silent about this on our side. I'm just reminding everybody now when, you know, Dr. Jill Biden is made like uh, head of you know HHS or something because she has a degree in education. But when that happens, it's going to be very hard for our side to say much about it without looking really hypocritical. But I know people don't care. Oh, he needs family members around him to advise him, people he can trust. Okay. I I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm keeping it real, team. I'm telling you the truth. This is a precedent that we will come to regret. This is a precedent that we will come to regret. But I know right now it's, uh, we said okay. We said, and hey, okay. we. Some of you thought no big deal. We'll see. Just just wait. Brett, Buck, ACB is crushing these Democrats in the Senate Judiciary Committee. I've seen her calmly and coolly put these uh, policy first mental people of very minimal height in their place over and over, whether it is about Obamacare, abortion, LBGTQ and issues of racial discrimination. However, I just watched her leap off the top rope and knock out Kamala, like Superfly Jimmy, Jimmy Snooker style. Do you remember him, Producer Mark? No, that's before my time. Ah, he was great. I think he, I think he got nabbed for like a cold case murder. Am I? Producer Nick, I feel, Producer Nick is my age, so he can, and he, you know, he can always weigh in on that stuff. I'm pretty sure Superfly Jimmy Snooker was like indicted for a, a murder. Should someone check me on that? I think that happened, which is really, you know, he used to, uh, I think he was Samoan and he wore a kind of a, like a leopard print mankini, but his move was to jump off the top turnbuckle and he was very acrobatic, very acrobatic. Uh, That is true. He was uh, indicted on third degree murder, but he was not tried because he was diagnosed with dementia. Oh. And the charges were dismissed. Oh. And he's, he, he has, he has passed on since. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, I, oh, he passed on. I didn't even know he passed away. I didn't realize yeah, that. He passed away in 2017. Hmm. He was. A, he, I, I went through a period. I think I was probably maybe 10 to 12 where I, I watched a fair amount of wrestling. I mean, Hulk Hogan in his day. That guy was great. Guy was great. All right. Uh, but yes, I come. Oh, sorry. I just watched her leap off the top buckle when she asking her if she believed climate change exists. The Kavanaugh hearing showed the American people how ruthless the Dems can be. An ACB hearing are showing us how juvenile and undeveloped their thinking can be. Um, Look, I I think that this was a little bit of a surprise for me that the Democrats 
seemed like they learned a little bit of a lesson from Kavanaugh. The backlash from what they did to him. It's not that they feel bad about it ethically, morally. It was unwise. What they did wasn't smart from the perspective of their lust for power. So as a result of that, uh, I think they backed off here a little bit. Plus, they, he's not a white male. And so much of what the Democrats have gotten really good at is trashing white males. That's really an area where they, where they excel. Um, white male Republicans, by the way, of course. Um, that, that goes without saying. So, yeah, ACB did a fabulous job, and they, they really, I was prepared for madness. I thought it was going to happen in some way, and look, it's not over yet. I should note, they haven't voted. You know, the fat late, I'm sorry, the, the Zoftig uh, self-identified female, because we cannot say the fat lady sings, the uh, pleasantly, no, no, I don't think, I don't think that works. What's a nice way? The horizontally ample, whatever, you get what I'm saying. Uh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. So, indeed. Ryan, Buck, your take on the Wolf v. Nancy dialogue was on point. Number one, you nailed it, calling the relationship between Pelosi and CNN the queen and her scribes. That's precisely what it is. Thank you very much, Ryan. I agree. I think that is precisely what it is. Number two, Pelosi just had to get the last word, and she sounded more desperate each time Wolf came back and tried to go bre uh, break it with a statement of conclusion. Pelosi got really desperate with the we feed them retort. We, we feed them. We feed them. And getting all grumpy Joe on the Wolf Man. Buck and Mark, the show is great. Keep up the great work. Dads in the audience, get the teens to tune in and keep passing the buck. That's awesome, Ryan. Thank you. I love hearing that the younger generation of up-and-coming patriots and constitutional conservatives Listen to the Buck Saxton show. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yes, indeed. And for those of you who are, who are Team Buck youth squad, so anybody who's like college age below, I know you're on the, the gram, but producer Mark, the Snow Princess, has been talking to me about up in my TikTok game a little bit. So just saying, might the Buck. I mean, now that it's not going to get banned, I, it wouldn't be a bad idea. She's, she is wise in these ways. And I was like, well, I have to make this look because she's quite a she's, you know, younger than me, um, almost by a decade. Not a, not quite a decade. She's 30. But uh, I. I was like, well, is that what the oh, cool you kids just made a grave mistake? You can't say the age on the air. No. Yes. After she's, after a certain age, she's 26. Come on. She's not listening. I hope to the show tonight. <laughs> I have to I have to make her something really yummy and like be like, oh no 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 don't don't, don't turn on your smartphone to listen into the no 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 no. You don't need yeah. to listen to that podcast. If only it was available on demand 24 seven. Yes, if only it was a thing that anyone could listen to anytime they want, even when I'm not around. Let's let's pretend like we don't all know that's the case. Um. So yes. Uh. Where were we here? We're now back to, uh, oh no, we already, oh no, TikTok. Yes, TikTok is something that I'm going to explore. I, I find it pretty addictive, actually, especially, uh, I just watch meat grilling videos. I realize this is my, some, you know, you find the thing that you just like to watch. I just like watching videos of people really cooking various red meat, mostly, sometimes some pork. They'll make some really nice roast chicken, but the TikTok thing is great with that. You check it out, producer Mark. There's some. I do almost every day. I admit it. I'm addicted. Yeah. Once you start, you start on it. You're, and I always wonder if the financial advice they're giving out on there is ever worthwhile too. They're like, here's how I took, and they're not trying to sell you anything from at least what I can see. It's they're like, here's how I took five dollars, bought a house, and started making you know a thousand dollars a month based on you know the reno that I did. And I'm always like, wait, what? How? But it's fun to watch. So, and there was these, uh, these shuffle dance videos that were really viral for a while. And then I tried a little bit of one because I was like, that would be kind of cool. And then I realized, oh, it's really hard and you have to be coordinated and good at dancing kind of to begin with. So, yeah, not as much of that. It's like watching break dancing videos. You'll think to yourself, ah, I can do that. Mm, usually not true. Usually not true. Unfortunately. <laughs> More roll call, just enough to uh, 
put a cap on things here. Send us off for the weekend because everybody is, in fact, working for the weekend, as you know. PJ here. Oh, wait, no, Garrick. Don't want to don't want to cut you out, Garrick. First of all, first of all, cool name. And second of all, hey, Buck, I enjoy the show. I've been listening almost religiously for the last few months. I enjoy the fact you don't sugarcoat anything and say how it is. I have a question regarding the hypocrisy of the left. How do they pull it off? The ability to lie to our faces and then have a double standard. Shields high and ad victoriam. Garrick, first of all, thank you. Yes, I know. And I, unlike some other folks that are in this business, I do say things that I know won't necessarily be popular, even with the people that I agree with and, and are my you know, compatriots on all these issues. I will tell them things that don't always necessarily go over as the most. Oh, we're going we're gonna to get full justice for, for the deep state coup. Nope, not going to happen as I've been saying all along. Anyway, uh, so I do try to tell everybody the truth always, and that is the guiding, that is the guiding North Star, the load star of this show. And as for um, how the left pulls off the hypocrisy, it's a question of uh, not having any reputation to protect. And also, because then you have a tremendous amount of latitude. You can do a lot when you don't have to worry about your reputation. And then beyond that, they control the institutions. Right? So think about it this way. If somebody, if a group of if a group of people who are all united um, in their beliefs about I don't know having uh, loud loud parties at night, if they take over your local homeowners association, and the only way that somebody can actually get kicked out of the homeowners association and get evicted is if the homeowners association votes and kicks that person out, let's just say. Well, guess what? <laughs> this is kind of the way the left operates. They control all of the mechanisms of these institutions that are supposed to be checks and balances on different parts of whether it's the media or everything else. And so that's when you can do that, you can be hypocritical. And that is what they do. PJ, hey, Buck and producer Mark, just wanted to let Buck know that I named my new World of Warcraft character after him. And I even th I think I got the image down pretty good. I have him equipped with a sword and shield. Because imaging is everything, and I hope people ask me about the name so I can spread the buck everywhere. Keep it up. You guys are doing great. Shields high. Well, thank you, PJ. Um, hopefully my World of Warcraft character doesn't look like Fat Thor, producer Mark. I'm kind of hoping it does. Yeah, we all know that. But uh, that's very cool, PJ. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, indeed. We, uh, we, I, I've never played World of Warcraft. Have you? I have not, no. Huh. Interesting. Very popular game. I very, I know, very popular game. Greg, hey, Buck, I just watched some of the town hall, and oh, man, it's unreal how a, a journalist from a major news network can get away with being that rude and disrespectful to a friggin' president of the United States. On another note, Trump does have some big, um, should we, um can I can, yes, big marbles, I can say that, going into these snake pits with leftists, and I think he holds his own. No other Republican would do that. Totally agree. Uh, the president is is brave enough and confident enough to go into hostile territory. You never see that. when was the last time? Why won't why won't Joe Biden sit down with Tucker Carlson, for example, for an interview? Why not? He'd ask him real questions, but Tucker would let him speak. He would show res he would show respect to the candidate. He's not the president, but he'd show respect to the candidate. Why not? Because Joe Biden's uh, you know too wimpy. And knows that it's not going to be a, a back rub like what he got from Stephanopoulos. So that's why. We all know it. Everybody, rest up this weekend. Recuperate. Get ready for next week. Two more weeks to go before election week, friends. It's going to be wild. So uh, take care of yourselves. In the meantime, pass the buck over the weekend. Shields high.